Uh, thank you. Um, can I ask uh, uh, the public leaving the public area to do so quietly as the Parliament is still in session? Um, the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 15513 in the name of Annabel Ewing on settled status scheme for EU citizens in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, but I'd ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. Now and I call on Annabel Ewing to open the debate. Ms Ewing, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased indeed to have the opportunity to debate my motion on the UK Government's EU settlement scheme. And I do thank those members who have added their names in support and therefore facilitated this members' debate today. At the outset, can I just say that I find the UK Government's approach to EU nationals to be abhorrent. For as a matter of principle, it is forcing individual citizens who have legally acquired rights further to international treaty to make an application to the UK government to seek to register in order to stay in the UK. That is to say, presiding officer, the UK government is forcing EU citizens to apply for rights they already have. It is, presiding officer, nothing less than the othering of EU citizens living in our country, which othering policies students of history will know are not without risk to societal cohesion. And it is, presiding officer, nothing short of the blatant rewriting of history in terms of the role that the EU has played on these aisles, UK membership dating back, of course, to 1973. But, presiding officer, these individuals, some 223,000 in Scotland, and some 3.5 million across the UK as a whole have been living in our country for years and they have been contributing to the economic life of our country and to the social fabric of our country. They have paid taxes into the Exchequer and they have paid national insurance contributions. They have their physical homes in our country and they regard our country as home. Presiding officer, it's yeah, officer, EU nationals are our friends, they are our neighbours, they are our work colleagues, they are our fellow students, and they are for many, in fact, family members. This week we heard of the heartbreaking story of Tovi McDonald, further to an interview broadcast by STV. Tovi McDonald is 87 years old. She was born in Denmark and has lived in Scotland for almost 60 years. She has children and grandchildren in Scotland. She was married here, she has friends here, and she has built her life here. But yet, the UK government has written to Tovey MacDonald insisting that she apply in order to be able to stay in her own home. She described receiving this letter thus, presiding officer, and I quote, I got a letter to say that because of Brexit, I had to register and I couldn't understand why. I thought this couldn't be right because I've been here for so many years, I thought it was absolutely crazy. It makes me feel very sad because this is my home and I feel more Scottish than Danish. I've got nowhere to go. This is my home. Who would ever have imagined that they would live to hear such a statement in 21st century Scotland? This is not who we are, presiding officer, and it is shaming for the UK government and for Ruth Davidson's Tories in Scotland who are happily going along with this. Indeed, not one Tory MSP has seen fit to sign my motion. <laughs> Presiding officer, the UK government must now bring this sorry saga to an end and scrap this policy. It is of dubious legality and it must be viewed as motivated by the anti-immigration factions that are now rife inside the Tory party right across the UK. It is an ugly, heartless policy and it is causing considerable uncertainty, anxiety and distress. Some weeks ago, the UK Prime Minister, further to a concerted campaign by the SNP, by Scottish Labour, the Scottish Green Party and the Scottish Liberal Democrats, bowed to pressure to abolish the proposed settlement scheme fee, which was to be charged for each application. And I would urge all these parties to keep up the pressure and to work with the Scottish Government to see the end of this truly grotesque policy. And when doing so, it is worth highlighting that many concerns have been raised in any event about the mechanics of the scheme, including the unrealistic deadline for applications, the limited means by which applications can be made in general, and the ability of the already dysfunctional UK Home Office to administer the scheme. 
Concerns have also been raised by the House of Lords EU Justice Subcommittee about the fact that there will be no physical piece of paper if applications are successful. Rather, there will be an electronic link only. And given the UK government's record on IT and on competence in general, that will be a very chilling prospect for many people, presiding officer. Moreover, any delays in processing applications will have implications far beyond mere administrative issues. Indeed, they could result, as has been stated by the think tank British Future, in many thousands of EU citizens being left with an insecure immigration status or indeed no status at all. And it should be noted in this regard that deportations have not been ruled out by the UK Prime Minister and her Tory party. It must be asked, therefore, presiding officer, whether the UK government has willfully learnt no lessons at all from the Windrush scandal, a point made by Baroness Helena Kennedy in the House of Lords recently. Here in Scotland, the Scottish government is doing all that it can within the limited powers that we have, as far as immigration powers are concerned, to help our fellow EU citizens. Specifically, Citizens Advice Scotland has been funded to provide a new advice service on rights, entitlements and requirements, which will be available across their network with a solicitor-led helpline to be established for more difficult and complex cases. So here in our country, in Scotland, at this time of great uncertainty and anxiety, our government is committed to doing all it can to speak up for and support our EU citizens, while the Westminster government in London is forcing EU citizens to apply to retain the rights they already have. What a contrast, presiding officer, a contrasting tale of two governments that will not be lost on the people of Scotland. For we did not vote for this. We want no part of this, and we will not put up with this. In conclusion, presiding officer, I would just wish to repeat what Scotland's First Minister said on the morning of the 2016 EU referendum result when speaking directly to citizens of other EU countries living in Scotland. She said, and I quote, you remain welcome here. Scotland is your home and your contribution is valued. For my part, presiding officer, I would like to reiterate that message and would like to take this opportunity today to say to my constituents in Cowdenbeath, to all those EU citizens living in Cowdenbeath constituency and to all those EU citizens living across Scotland, you remain welcome here. Scotland is your home and your contribution is valued. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Ms. Ewing. I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wish to begin by recognising, by thanking Annabel Ewing and, and recognising what was an excellent speech that brilliantly and in a very measured way, which can be challenging in debates like this, summarised the salient points. And I also want to recognise the outstanding contribution of EU nationals in my constituency of Renfisher South, EU nationals in Barhead, Neilston, Up the Moor, and Johnston, Eldersley, Linwood, Brookfield, Kilbarkin, Howwood, Loch Winnock. To those who volunteer in our third sector in Renfisher South, to those who work for Renfisher Council and East Renfisher Council, to those who work in our businesses and in our hospitality sector, to those in every area of our life, to our friends and our neighbours in Renfrewshire South, to the, I want to recognise the EU nationals who work in this parliament and make such an outstanding contribution. I want to recognise the contribution that all EU nationals across Scotland make. And I also want to make a point, because I'm not speaking about someone different when I say an EU national, because I am an EU national. I am an EU citizen, and I am proud to be an EU citizen. And I will fight to my dying breath to ensure that we maintain our EU citizenship and that one day we will see an independent Scotland as a full member of the European Union where we are all European citizens. Because, presiding officer, European citizenship is not some abstract, it's not some legalism. It was born out of the ashes of two calamities that befell the continent in the first half of the 20th century. The wisdom in EU citizenship, the wisdom in that shared identity came at the expense of the blood of countless millions of men and women and children across the continent. And if we forget that, if we allow ourselves to lapse into a rather numb, unthinking, bureaucratic state of mind, then that is a very dangerous place to get to. 
because it allows the insidious creep of intolerance of the othering that Annabelle spoke about. And I have to say, presiding officer, I staunchly, I so deeply regret that we are in this position today where we are having to debate this. But first and foremost, we must recognise the contribution that our EU friends, our brothers, our sisters, our neighbours, our co-workers, our families make to this country in enriching us. It was one of Europe's great authors, Marcel Proust, who said, the real vo voyage of discovery consists not in seeing new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Well, within Europe, we do see new landscapes. We have the opportunity through freedom of movement to travel but through mixing, through engaging, through that cultural exchange, we enhance ourselves, we develop ourselves, and we also see with new eyes. We become better people. Our EU citizenship enhances us, and that is the great gift that the European Union, that freedom of movement, and the ability for all EU citizens to live anywhere in this continent has bestowed upon us. But there's something fundamentally different in a state of mind when you visit a country and go through passport control and know you have a mere three months where you can stay and you're a visitor. It's a fundamentally different state of mind for anyone in Scotland who can go to Paris, to Krakow, to Athens, to, to Madrid, to Lisbon, to any European capital, to any European city, state. and know they don't have the right just to visit, but to settle there, to live there, to work there, but it becomes a sense of collective ownership and responsibility that binds our people together on this continent, that realises the vision of the founders of the European Union, which was to ensure that never again would this continent go to war. And when we start to unpick that tapestry that we have wove, that rich and ennobling tapestry that we have woven over the past 60 years, then we risk further down the line another catastrophe befalling our continent. And the reality is, a very practical reality for Scotland is, uh, without EU nationals, we will not be able to build the fairer, more prosperous, more equal country that we all seek. We know the challenges facing Scottish public finances as a consequence of the demographics the reality is that while within Scotland, our working age population is just as productive as the working age population, indeed more so than many other parts of the UK, our population overall is ageing. And without that freedom of movement, without sending that message to citizens in Europe and indeed to across the world that they're welcome, we will not be able to build that better Scotland. So I want to conclude by thanking Annabel Young for bringing forward this motion, for thanking all those who signed it and to say that we will continue to fight for our fellow EU citizens and to ensure that their citizenship is restored in full as members of an independent Scotland within the European Union. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Arthur. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Alec Rowley. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, for allowing me to leave after my uh, presentation and speech this afternoon, as I have uh, individuals to meet, and then I'm coming back into the chamber to take the first question on rural uh, uh, economy after. I'm grateful for the opportunity to take part today, and I would like to uh, acknowledge and congratulate Annabel Ewing for uh, bringing this member's business debate to the chamber. I very much value the significant contribution that migrants to Scotland make to our economy, our culture and our everyday parts of life. Deputy Presiding Officer, regarding the EU settlement scheme, recommendations will be taken on board, which is why this scheme is initially launched as a pilot. During this time, the procedures will go through the prototype stage, just as any initial would go through in this process. There will be a strong enough options that particular procedures will, the scheme and the UK government will listen to the options and act accordingly if appropriate, which is precisely why that has been done uh, and the withdrawing of the application fee has been dealt with. Any person who has already applied during the pilot scheme will also have their fee reimbursed. The decisions made clear at... Okay. Annabelle Ewing. I'm grateful to the member for taking the intervention. I, I hear that, that there's a pilot and it's moving to a, a scheme and the UK government may listen to some things, but that may not. Who knows? The, the fact of the matter is, though, there will be the EU settlement scheme. Why should EU citizens like Tove MacDonald, who has lived in this country for 60 years, be forced by the Tory government to apply for rights that she already has? Alexander Stewart. I acknowledge what Ms Ewing is saying and I also acknowledge what uh, the individual has made a representation. And I feel uncomfortable. Uh, I'm not denying the fact. 
uh, about that situation, uh, and I think that needs to be looked at uh, because it has to be looked upon in, in, a, in a process. Uh, and, and I'm sure, and I continue, uh, a representation will be made. I have no doubt. Indeed, the nature uh, of this, uh, uh, the, the permanent status of individuals uh, and, and offering them the ability to come forward, I think, is vitally important. So, indeed, uh, as the uh, ability, uh, as I said before, the UK government will continue to welcome the best and the brightest to this country. And I think that's vitally important that we do. However, as with as such schemes have been in the past, uh, we had to identify the processes involved uh, to ensure that we understand the benefits for both the host country and the applicant. Therefore, I, like others, am delighted that the UK government has abandoned its plans to change and charge EU citizens a fee when applying for the right to remain in Scotland through the settlement scheme. Governments in EU countries have already said that UK citizens living in other parts uh, of the world will be treated in a similar way as to how the UK government treats EU citizens living in the UK, and this is rightly to be expected. It is interesting to note that the UK government has additionally researched and has agreements with non-EU uh, countries like Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, as well as separate agreements with Switzerland. These countries are happy with the current arrangements and the national of these countries have the ability to apply for EU settlement scheme uh, from March uh, the 30th, uh, 30th 2019. Providing officer, the new system of obtaining settled status will be streamlined user-friendly and will draw on existing government's data information that is a burden for applicants with evidence. Applications will not be refused on minor technicalities without attaching and giving that appropriate and giving them the opportunity to refer to data. Caseworker consideration applications mm -hmm. will exercise the reason on favour of the applicants where appropriate. Uh, and, the, and as a result, the Home Officer said it will expect a, a vast majority of cases to be granted, with refusals being most likely to be only on uh, serious criminality. Uh, and individuals who are not part. It is also important that we understand and we obtain uh, where we can absence the UK uh, and individuals can stay uh, outside uh, the UK for five years without losing their settlement status. So I I've already heard uh, uh, Ms Ewing make uh, some comments uh, and there's no doubt that this is quite a volatile issue uh, during the current negotiations and I indicated right at the start that I and my party recognise the importance of the value of migrants coming to our country. Many have made their lives here and contribute to our business community, our academic and our political life. They are most welcome and have that right to remain and should be treated with dignity and respect. And as I said, uh, I think the case that Ms. Ewing uh, brings forward indicates that there's some way to go in managing that process. They have to uh, and they continue to make a significant contribution to the way of life that we have here. So I once again thank Ms. Ewing for bringing this forward uh, and I look forward to seeing the processes that will be achieved in the subject and that we have play, and we all play our part to ensure the stability and the continuity of the subject going forward. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, thank you, Mr Stewart. I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Mr Rowley, please. Presiding Officer, I welcome this debate today on the Settled Status Scheme for EU citizens in Scotland. I was pleased to support the motion from Annabel Ewan and I would want to associate myself with the speech that she made today. Although I do think it is ridiculous that the Tories have brought us to a place where it warrants discussion about something that seems so obvious. Those who live here in Scotland, work here in Scotland, have families here in Scotland and homes here in Scotland should clearly have an automatic right to remain and should not and had never been subject to the proposal of the Tory government at Westminster of having to pay for the status and rights they currently already have. I'm glad this proposal was hastily scrapped by the Tories amid strong criticism from MPs and campaigning groups. Although the fact it was proposed in the first place only shows to highlight how much of a mess the Tories are making when it comes to Brexit. The Labour Party would never have used peoples living in this country as a pawn in cheap negotiation tactics and frankly it is shameful that they were ever treated in this way. EU citizens living in Scotland contribute greatly to our country both culturally and economically. Diverse communities experience wide-ranging cultural benefits, especially through exchanges in ideas and customs, as well as making our world a more connected place. 
Migrants from the EU contribute £2,300 more to the Exchequer each year in net terms than the average adult. And over their lifetime, they pay in £78,000 more than they take out in public services and benefits. However, it is time we as a country started talking about immigration. It has become an almost taboo subject to raise, which has in turn resulted in those with extreme views capitalising on the lack of discussion and playing up to people's fears. We as a country need to talk about immigration and try to disperse the myths and indeed the fears people have around it. For it is the case here in Scotland that we need not less but more immigration. Scotland has an ageing population and as a result of this we will require more immigration in the future simply in order to sustain public services and support the increases in that elderly population. We only have to look at the Windrush scandal last year to see that our immigration system is broken. Theresa May has proposed a post-Brexit salary threshold for skilled immigrants at £30,000 level. This is just ridiculous, given that so many of our carers and NHS staff are migrants. How could we possibly maintain the level of services required when so many skilled workers will be blocked from working in the UK? We already are seeing our health service and social care system struggling with funding problems. But if we remove access to a huge workforce resource, then what will that mean for those in need? Brexit has highlighted quite starkly that we as a country need to work on dispelling fears around immigration. But government has a huge role to play in this. And frankly, the Tories have a lot to answer for in stirring up the rhetoric of fear in order to try and score political points. It is time, presiding officer, they stopped using people's lives in the way they have been and started standing up for our country as a whole. I'm happy to support the motion. Thank you very much. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Jamie Green. Mr Green will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr McMillan. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, at the outset, I'd like to thank my um, friend and colleague, Annabel Ewing, for securing uh, this important debate. Now, the campaign, which uh, has been successful so far, proves that when parties actually work together, they can encourage and force some political change. Now, clearly, in this, in this Parliament, every party deserves some credit, except, that is, for the Conservatives. Now, the Tories, either willingly uh, or just uh, through some uh, blind... Uh, blind uh, dogmatic approach seem to have forgotten how important EU nationals actually are to Scotland and also to the rest of the UK and it has been a complete and utter embarrassment to actually instigate this settled status fee. Now Tom Arthur in his contribution earlier on spoke about the, about the history of the EU project and I can't agree with him anymore uh, on that but it's so so important to actually to understand and appreciate why the EU has came about and, so, and why, so how important it actually was for that to be the case. Now, the fee uh, has to be a, it was to be £65. Now, some would claim that that wouldn't actually break the bank for many people, but, presiding officer, the fee could be 65 pence for all I can, well, I'm concerned. It's not the issue of how much it was. It's about the messages sent out to people. It's setting out two things, two messages to EU nationals. First of all, they weren't wanted. And secondly, they were going to become a bargaining chip in the shambolic EU negotiations being led by the worst Prime Minister in history. They were to be used to tell the EU negotiators that they will be tough in the talks. Now, what the Prime Minister and her acolytes have done is actually to turn Britain into a laughingstock. Now, the so-called Great Britain that the Tories so proclaim that they actually support and love it will actually have the reputation that isn't great across the EU and beyond. The Prime Minister and her revolving door of ministers, apart from Chris Grayling, of course, actually are telling people that Britain is uncaring. It was claimed that in the past that the, the UK's negotiating skills have reduced somewhat uh, by becoming a member of the European Union. Now, it certainly appears to be true in this case. The EU isn't kicking us out, but the UK seems absolutely hell-bent on going out, leaving as sour a taste as possible 
to make things worse and for the future. Sure. Tom Arthur. I wonder if Mr McMillan would agree with me that a fitting motto for the UK government in the whole Brexit process would be stop the world Britain wants to get off. <laughs> Stuart McMillan. I absolutely agree, uh, Mr Arthur. I absolutely agree. Now, I mean, presenting off some, I mean, who genuinely thought that imposing a charge on people who are our neighbours, our friends, our family members, our colleagues, our active members of society, teachers, nurses, doctors, engineers, footballers, rugby players, and many, many more, was a good thing. Who genuinely thought that by imposing a charge on EU nationals, it was actually going to build up some goodwill during the negotiations? Brexit is serious. It will have a huge effect upon the lives of everyone living in the four nations that currently make up the UK, as well as the people living in the EU27. This isn't a game of chicken. These are real people with real lives and real futures. I don't for one minute think that all the Tories in this Parliament actually supported what was to be deployed. They will have towed the line to support the London Masters. Now, I get that, I understand that, I understand the fact we've got internal party discipline. Every member in this chamber will get that. However, on something like this, forcing people who live here, and many of them have been here for decades, to actually pay for the privilege to remain in their own home, to remain with their families, to remain in their communities, to remain in their job, was the worst kind of dog whistle politics. Now, Scottish Tories didn't need to sign up to that. They could have been different, but they proved that whether it's in Scotland or that it's across the UK, the nasty party is well and truly back. I truly welcome the U-turn by the Prime Minister on the £65 fee, but the damage has been done. I'm a firm believer that prevention is better than the cure. Every government will make mistakes, and this one was a howler of epic proportions. The sour taste will linger for many years, long after Brexit. And this is in addition to the Windrush scandal telling the population that if you're different, you will remain different. That stinks and is deplorable. I understand uh, why people are rightly angry, and I understand why people like former MSP Christian Ella were so vocal about this scandal. And every Tory who supported the scheme should hang their head in shame. And my final comment on this, presenting officer, is that the Tories need to apologise to our friends, our neighbours, and every EU national living and contributing to society, including to the staff of this Scottish Parliament. Thank you very much. I call Jamie Green, please. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Um, I've, I'd had written a speech uh, on today's date, but I, I've listened carefully to what members have to say, and I, I do accept uh, some of what they're saying, because I think we as parliamentarians have a duty to um, work together on, on some of these issues. And, you know, we had a very lengthy debate about Brexit the other day, four hours of it in this parliament. And, yeah, there was a lot of theatre involved, but there was also a lot of sense come out of that as well. And my colleague, Jackson Carlos, stood in this podium here and spoke about some of the, the issues that Ms Ewing referred to around how people feel about this process. And I share his sentiment. I share Ms Ewing's sentiment on some of that. But I would like to explain why. And I did read the motion. There's lots to agree with it, but there are a few things that I don't. And if you would give me the benefit of explaining why I didn't sign uh, the motion. And I'm not going to use the debate today to talk about Brexit as a wider issue or EU citizenship and what it means to people uh, who are Scottish or British or Scottish independence and what may or may not happen. I'd like to talk about specifically around the processes by which we achieve something that I think we all want to achieve and that's securing the rights of EU citizens. Um, I welcome the U-turn that was made on the fee. Um, we didn't have any specific role to play in that policy. It was a Home, off, home Office decision. Um, did it sit uncomfortably with, with some members, perhaps? So, uh, was the decision to abolish it the right one? Yes, it was. Um, but I do have this conundrum about the process by which we secure EU citizens' rights. Anyone who knows me, and any member from across the chamber that I have discussions about immigration with, uh, including members of the government's front bench, will know that I think there's a positive case for inward immigration to Scotland and there's a sensible conversation to be had around that. But those who are already here and those who wish to come here post 29th of March need uh, to have some form of security and certainty that the process that they follow will give them the rights that they need and indeed the ones that they already have. And let me explain why that's important to me. I've lived in Europe before. I've lived in Spain, in the Netherlands, in France. I've been through that process of turning up in a new country to live and work. But I've also been through the processes of those countries and respected 
their domestic processes to apply for residency in those places. The reason I went through that process is because I wanted to enjoy the benefits that they enjoyed of employment benefits, of being able to pay tax locally and be a meaningful part of their economies. I've had to apply for identity cards, registration of my uh, citizenship there. And, and, and this is partially because of why we are where we are. We are not in Schengen. We do not have domestic ID cards or residency cards. And indeed, no one else has ever left Europe before. So it was against that backdrop that we're in this conundrum of how do we guarantee the rights of those from outside uh, a, a, a state of unions that we will no longer be uh, a member of. The, fr the phraseology in the motion says that we want to scrap uh, the settlement scheme. If we were to do so, and it is a question, which legal means do we have available to us to secure the rights of those who are already here? It is not an automatic process because the constitutional changes that will have taken place means there needs to be some form of process. I, I, I really have very little time, but maybe the minister can sum up. Maybe the minister, I've got, I've got a lot more to say if it's okay. I'm not refusing to take an invention for the record. Well, I'll uh, take now, an invention uh, I've got Mr. Ewing, to, uh, everything sake. through the chair, please. And the member has absolutely every right not to take an intervention. He only has four minutes or thereabouts. It's a matter for him. Thank you. Please proceed. I, I wish we had longer to, 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 I would love to take an intervention, but I just simply don't have time. I want to point out that as if, if this is the logic, there is no settlement scheme for EU residents in the UK, then surely we would be calling as a parliament that there should be nothing for UK residents in Europe. Now, for example, Spain have offered reciprocal rights for UK nationals, but they've, also, they've already said they will need to apply for something called a foreigner identity card. So what do we do as a parliament? Do we welcome that because they've offered that reciprocal rights? Or do we condemn it because it inv involves a card, a process, or some form of registration? And that is the conundrum that we face. I, I want these bilateral agreements that secure UK rights in Europe, and I want to secure UK nationals' rights in the UK. But let's make sure that it's as simple and fair and respectful a process in both directions as it can and should be. There, there is much to agree uh, within the motion today, but I cannot agree that there should be no process whatsoever, because I think if there were no process, it would make it difficult to actually secure the outcome that I think we collectively uh, want to achieve, and that is securing the EU citizens' rights. Those who are already here, I want them to stay. I welcome them. I don't believe that anyone uh, in the benches uh, that I sit on uh, do not want them to stay, and I think any suggestion otherwise is not just unfair, um, but deeply saddening. Thank you, Sir Officer. Thank you very much, Mr. Green. And I call Ben McPherson to close to the Government. Minister, please. Thank you, President Officer. First of all, I too would like to congratulate Annabelle Ewing on securing this incredibly important debate at this time. But I say that with regret because Scotland is a remarkable European, outward looking, welcoming country. And we shouldn't be having to have this debate. My message to EU citizens, as has been the, the, the message from the majority of speakers, is that Scotland is your home. You will always be welcome here. We want you to stay. And the Scottish Government will do all it can to support you to stay. And all of us can't say that enough to our EU citizen friends, neighbours, colleagues and loved ones. Presiding officer, we must never lose sight of the fact that behind all the talk of amendments, withdrawal agreements, negotiations, the abolition of fees, people and their lives lie directly in this situation and are directly affected. People like Toby MacDonald, who's been mentioned, who after 59 years of living in Scotland, must now apply for the right to live in her home. An awful situation. And when I saw Toby McDonald's interview, I thought of so many others I've met and spoken to over recent months and years from Poland and Italy and France and other countries in the EU. Real people, real stories. People who have made their home here, who have brought up their families here, who pay their taxes, are valued members of their community, and yet now are being forced to apply for the right to stay in their home. This cannot be right. This is not right. In response to this, the Scottish Government is clear about the need to ensure that EU citizens feel valued and welcomed in Scotland. 
That has been at the heart of everything we have done since the EU referendum in 2016. Yet we are working against the backdrop of a narrative from the UK government that is deeply unhelpful, to say the very least. Their hostile environment policy is hurting people. Presiding officer, before Christmas, this parliament debated the rights of EU citizens. And one of our key asks in that debate was that the settled status fee should be abolished. An argument that was rejected at the time by the UK government. But soon after, from pressure from the Scottish government, this parliament, together with key partners such as the three million, we played a central role together in getting the fee for settled status scrapped. Yes. Emma Harper. Thank you. I've been sitting here listening to this debate and I too am concerned for the many EU citizens in my South Scotland region. And you're talking about the settled scheme and I'm also interested in the seasonal agricultural workers scheme that has been developed for, um, for the agricultural workers that are fruit pickers or vegetable pickers. But does the minister recognise that the, the government's designing of the seasonal agricultural workers scheme has completely disregarded the dairy farms? 48% are in the southwest of Scotland, and it's not seasonal. They're all year round, and they don't even probably meet the tier two £30,000 requirements to stay in this country. Mr. Uh, Minister. Thank, thank the member for that question. The seasonal agricultural worker scheme is uh, useful in some ways, but is absolutely inadequate and will certainly not be a substitute for freedom of movement. And that is why we in the Scottish Government are pressing the UK government to rethink its white paper proposals, but are also putting forward proposals for flexibility within a UK framework within devolution in order to try and obtain solutions for Scotland in a post-Brexit environment, which of course we don't want to happen. We would prefer to maintain freedom of movement, but in the face of, of, of what, what's coming at us, we are trying our best to stand up for the interests of Scotland, including dairy farmers. Getting back to the settled status scheme, let me be clear that this, the scrapping of the fee was just a small concession from Westminster because demanding that our colleagues, neighbours, friends and family pay to remain in their homes should never have been suggested in the first place. The proposal to charge a fee was always unacceptable, but it is not the only issue with the settled status scheme. EU citizens should not have to apply. And I noticed that one of the Tory speakers talked about the applicant a number of times. These are not applicants. These are people who are embedded in our communities and welcome parts of our country, welcome citizens in our country. People should not have to apply for the rights they already enjoy. And to answer one of the Conservative members' questions, instead they could have and should have been automatically granted status unless there was a very good reason not to. And the responsibility for obtaining this should not lie with individuals to apply, but with the UK government that has imposed this wrong-headed scheme. The UK government could have and should have chosen to secure EU citizens' rights as a priority after the vote for Brexit, separate to any withdrawal agreement. They could have done this, they could have led on this, and that would have been the right thing to do. I'll take the intervention. Jamie Green. Can I thank the Minister for the intervention? I hear what he's saying. Is it therefore, by that logic, the Scottish Government's official policy that the EU27 should give automatic residency to all UK nationals living in Europe at the moment without any form of process or registration? Is that his policy? Minister. My understanding is that this only became a live issue in the negotiations because it was one of the Prime Minister's red lines. And if the UK Government had shown leadership and ethical leadership as well by securing the rights of EU citizens, then she could have encouraged the EU remaining 27 to do the same. That should have been done years ago, and it certainly is something that we would back now. The security of EU citizens in all members of the, of, uh, of, of the European Union should be paramount, and, 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 and we absolutely support that. Despite assurances from the Home Office that the settled status scheme would be simple with a presumption of acceptance, there are serious and mounting concerns about its operation. The UK government has left a vacuum where it should be providing information, advice and support to EU citizens across the UK. Many EU citizens simply do not know that they need to apply because the UK government has not done nearly enough to raise awareness of the scheme and provide much needed assistance with applications. That is why the Scottish government 
in the weeks and months ahead will redouble its efforts to reach out and provide EU citizens with the information and support they need. We have already made provision for an advice and support service delivered through Citizens Advice Scotland, which will provide assistance over and above anything that the UK government is doing, despite it being clearly their responsibility. But the concerns do not end there, presiding officer. The UK government's insistence that all applications must be made online doesn't work for significant numbers of people. The issue with Apple devices not being able to, to, to be used for the scheme has been much debated. But for many people, it's not a question of which device they use. It is about having the digital skills and the confidence to trust your future to an online application. I know that many EU citizens are concerned about their ability to access services, housing and employment in the future. What I hear consistently is that many individuals want physical proof of their status, something that they can show to evidence their rights. The UK government should listen and in addition to the proposed electronic proof of status, provide individuals with a physical document evidencing their status. Again, this could have been proactively provided through a declarative process rather than an applicant process. Presiding officer, the Home Office say that the vast majority of those who've applied during the test phase have been granted status. Yet, there is no information on the number of people who were incorrectly granted pre-settled status instead of settled status. The Home Office must look at this as a matter of urgency. We acknowledge that those granted pre-settled status are faced with many more months of even or even years of uncertainty. The onus will be on them to remember, perhaps in several years' time, that they then need to reapply for settled status. Presiding officer, it is incumbent for the UK government to make sure this doesn't happen. The Home Office must notify individuals when they become eligible to apply for settled status. Presiding officer, in conclusion, my overarching concern is the same as Trovi MacDonald, a grandmother who fears being the victim of another Windrush scandal. The UK scheme is unprecedented in its nature and scale, and entrusting its delivery to the department responsible for Windrush is wrong-headed in the extreme. The UK government must look again at the fundamentals of the EU settled status scheme and address the urgent concerns I and many others have raised all of which could critically undermine the ability of our friends, neighbours, colleagues and family to, to continue their lives here in Scotland. Presiding officer, let me also conclude by saying this again. This parliament, and indeed Scotland, welcomes and supports the many EU citizens who have built their lives here and call here home. We are better for having them here. We know they love Scotland and we love them too and want them to stay and continue to feel welcome as part of our communities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting of Parliament till 2 p.m.